check the cable on the mic and I just reset it. So we'll see if I come on. Check one, two. All right, is this one on? Okay. Yes. Right. Yep. We'll go with this and then I'll just project for the rest of the service. So <coughs> bear with me. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you and God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So there's a long running tradition of people starting petitions or calls to action to have someone intervene and ban dihydrogen monoxide, or DHMO, with the warnings that it is a colorless, odorless, tasteless chemical which kills thousands every year by accidental inhalation. Prolonged exposure to its solid form can cause tissue damage, and overconsumption of its liquid form can cause excessive sweating, urination, bloating, electrolyte imbalance, or vomit. Those who find themselves dependent upon it will die after suffering withdrawal. Moreover, DHMO is a major component in acid rain, can cause severe burns, it erodes our landscapes, it accelerates the corrosion of metals, and it has been found in the removed tumors of cancer patients. It is a major component of many pesticides, which in fact remains on produce even after it's been sufficiently washed. It regularly causes millions of dollars worth of property damage, and yet it remains present in every single stream, river, lake, and reservoir in America. Even the Antarctic ice has been contaminated by it, and I'm sorry to say it's in your faucets at home as well. And of course, the joke of all of this is that dihydrogen monoxide is just a fancy way of saying H2O, and so anyone who signs these petitions or calls to actions is trying to ban water. So these petitions are put forth usually as social experiments in order to expose human gullibility, our own scientific illiteracy, or the way that facts can be selectively presented to fearmonger, especially when you use scary sounding chemical names. But it works. You can find a somewhat depressing list on Wikipedia of all the times that the hoax has been done successfully and people have called politicians to ban it or people have flooded their utilities companies and are demanding that they act about DHMO contamination. But it's true, water can be quite dangerous. If you've been in our midweek services the last two weeks, we've talked about the flood and the Red Sea. We see water can be a hugely destructive force, which is why the current counties around us are issuing states of emergency and providing sandbags against potential flooding after all the snowfall we've had these last few months. At the same time, though, once I explained it is H2O, it becomes laughable that anyone would try to ban water because we all recognize it's really necessary. While water can kill, it also certainly makes alive. Every survivalist knows you can go weeks without food if necessary. I think the average is about three months, but you can only go about three days without water before you're in serious trouble. And you know, current flooding concerns aside, we're all desert folk. We know how crucial it is for our city to have enough water to fill our reservoirs, to water our crops, to take care of our households and our, our herds. We need water to function, and we all know that overpowering thirst you've had after you've been working out in the sun on a hot summer day and you haven't had a chance to break for a nice glass of cool, refreshing water. I bring all this up because when we get to today's Old Testament reading, it's really tempting and it's really easy to just write it off as Israel doing what Israel does best, which is complaining. You know, that's really all they seem to do throughout the whole book of Exodus. You know, as I observed in last Wednesday's sermon, that's how they start their journey. As soon as they're set free from Pharaoh, the first thing they do is start complaining that Moses has brought them out there to die until you know, God parts the Red Sea and they finally recognize the full deliverance he has given them. And one would think that this would be a recognition that God is indeed going to be with them through this whole journey and will continue to provide for them, and yet... Just a couple of chapters after the Red Sea, they are once more complaining. We don't have enough food. There was plenty of food in Egypt. Why did, why did we ever leave? Let's go back to Egypt where we'll have enough food. And then, you know, God has to provide them with manna from heaven. And again, they see he is fulfilling his promise to watch over them and care for them until they get to the promised land and can eat of its harvests. 
couple of chapters after that, we get to today's reading, where once again they are complaining. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So at this point, it is easy to just write them off as a bunch of whiners who will never be satisfied with anything. Of course, by now they should have it through their thick skulls. God is going to see them all the way to Canaan like he's always said he would. And, you know, it's really easy for us to say that because we can skip to the end. We know how it already ends. But before we're too quick to judge them, we need to take a step back. Remember, they're experiencing it live. They can't just flip a couple of pages and see how it all ends. <coughs> So put yourself in their shoes. Remember, they're freshly out of Egypt. They're freshly out of slavery. And you know, by no means am I saying the enslavement was a good thing, but it's understandable they have a slave mentality after serving Pharaoh for the last 430 years or so. Yes, their owners were brutal, but they did provide for them in some way. Even if all they got were bread and water rations, Egypt did have a vested interest in keeping their slaves alive. So they're used to getting something regularly provided. They're used to at least having basic provisions. And now they find themselves wholly reliant on Moses and a God who, you know, until recently, didn't do a whole lot of signs and wonders for them. So yes, the plagues and the Red Sea and the manna are all really, really impressive. But those have not been the norm for Israel for the last 400 years. So can we really blame them for being a little bit skeptical that they're going to continue when this is all kind of new to them? So remember, now they're in the desert. They've just relocated to a new area. They know they need water. They're thirsty after traveling. They have kids and livestock to care for. And they're setting up camp. And you know, the first thing you do when you set up camp is look around. Where is the water source? So they're looking around, and there's not a water source around. So can we really blame them for being a little bit anxious about having something to drink? So not only are they physically thirsty for water, but they're also spiritually thirsty for further assurance that things are going to work out, that God really is going to stick it out with them on this whole trip and not go silent for another 400 years like he had in the past. Now, I'm not trying to discount or excuse their sin. Yes, they are wrong for doubting God in the face of everything he's done for them in their very recent past. And Moses is perfectly justified naming that place Masa and Meribah, which translates to tested and quarreling, because the people are putting God to the test, saying, is the Lord among us or not, as they quarrel against Moses' leadership. And yes, as Jesus reminds us, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So I'm not saying that they're wrong, that they're not wrong here. They are committing sin and doubting God. But I do want to point out, from a human perspective, it is understandable. It's more understandable than we in our hindsight like to present it. And it's important to recognize this because we likewise have a tendency to doubt God and test him and quarrel him in similar ways. And we don't even wait until we find ourselves homeless in the desert without a water source to do it. Every day in our lives, it's, God, why didn't you give me that job? You were supposed to lead me to career success and prosperity. God, why won't my kids go to sleep and give me a moment's peace? You were supposed to give me happy and well-behaved children. God, why does my back always hurt? I, I put my faith in you, and you were supposed to give me health and happiness. God, I don't like where I am in my life right now. I need some proof that you're still here. I am thirsty for your presence, your assurance. Are you really here with me? You know, before we, before we jump to judge Israel for their moments of weakness, we need to remember that most of the time, Israel is us. So our hope in this passage then comes from remembering how the Lord does deal with Israel in this circumstance. Yeah, it's true, he's not a big fan of their complaints and doubts, and yes, Moses does give that place a rather convicting name that's going to remind Israel for the rest of its history of their sin and weakness, but at the end of the day, the Lord does provide for them. Even when he knows this is not the last time Israel is going to falter and doubt and test him, they do it, like I said, the entire book of Exodus. But he still instructs Moses to go forth and strike that rock, and when he does, water does flow forth. And so the people are given this opportunity to slake their thirst, both their physical thirst in drinking the water that comes from the rock, but also their spiritual thirst. They are once more reassured God is indeed with them. He will see them through to the end of their promises. 
As St. Paul reflects on the situation in his letter to the Corinthians, he writes, Our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Through it all, God remained with Israel and kept all his promises to them. Even when they were faithless, he remained faithful. Even when they sinned, forgiveness was always made available to the repentant. God never wholly abandoned them like the people feared he was going to, and yeah, we can make the argument they maybe, maybe deserved it, but he didn't. So likewise, when we find ourselves in doubt, when we sin and we test God and we question his ways and he leads us into the places where we don't really want to be, which yeah, happens more than we might like to admit, but when we lose sight of everything he's done for us in the past, and we can't look beyond the hardships we're facing now, we remember that he still gives us the living waters of Christ. He gives us his church where we can come to receive the word and sacrament and the assurance that he is with us, that he does deliver unto us forgiveness of our sins, that he does endure through our trials with us. He remains faithful to us when we are likewise faithless until that day when he does bring us home to the promised land of eternal life with him. We know Christ is the rock upon which the church is built, and from that rock flows streams of living water. So in the church, you receive the living water of baptism, which, yes, kills our old cells, but also raises us up alive in Christ. So that now, being brought into the church, we have the assurance of forgiveness. We can hear the words of absolution and know that they apply to us. We can receive the body and blood of our Savior at the altar and receive the spiritual food and drink we need as we physically receive and partake of the Lord's forgiveness. So you who are weary of your journey, who don't maybe like your life situation, who do have to confess that you have doubted and tested God, come forth and receive him. Place your faith and trust in him that just as surely as he brought Israel to the promised land that he had given to Abraham, he will bring you too to the salvation that he has promised all of us in Christ. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until the light everlasting.